So today I have a specific topic that I would like to discuss because I'm quite passionate about learning, but and the topic itself is about linking both work cultures with learning. It's about how to disrupt the training so that it, at the scale it becomes something where we have great cultures. Now, the funny thing is that many corporations are looking to transform. There is approximately 78% of corporations that are looking or that are working on transforming their culture. Now, culture means, in fact, that you have to make it possible so that employees have their own representation of behaviors. Now, it is quite challenging, in fact, if you think about it, how to learn to have your own type of behaviors in an organization that are aligned with your purpose, that are aligned with the values that you have uh, defined, and also how do you create this new mindset and rituals that are going to make great, healthy cultures. For today, I wanted to have a new version of learning, a way that is disruptive with an attitude that can be considered punk. So I have invited the queen of punk attitude for learning. And let me tell you a little bit more about Priscilla Barnagi. Pris is the founder and CEO of Binnovative, which is a design thinking process management platform. Design thinking is basically about having a bunch of ideas that are focused on the key pains of customers. And she's also the founder and CEO of Superflow, which is the next generation training platform supporting high performing collaborative teams, coaches, and people who are creating. Funny enough is that Chris is also recognized by Forbes 30 under 30. She has been winning several competitions, some of them that are quite famous, like the Singularity U first global impact competition for Central Europe, uh, Central Eastern Europe region, the next web innovation challenge, tech match in Silicon Valley, we, you, you name it, in fact. And she's also teaching courses ac ac across the globe. And one of the things is that she, her background is a, in psychology. She has been studying in several places, like in Hungary, in Copenhagen. By the way, I have been spending some time in Copenhagen. So I have a little bit of the basics of Danish. And she's also graduated from the Singularity University. Chris, I'm so happy to have you with me because I have got also the opportunity to work with some of your tools. And I got like kind of in love with, with the approach of recreating learning. And I have a question for you, Pris. According to you, what are the top challenges that organizations have today to scale up a great work culture? Thank you, Ivan. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today and um, to have an inspiring conversation about where learning is, but where it could be. Um, so there are obviously a lot of challenges companies are facing today um, when they try to scale up a great culture. I think we can approach it from three different angles. And the first one is definitely the first step. How do you onboard new employees and how quickly do you want them to get up on speed? You have a couple of options. Uh, first, maybe uh, you provide a training program that is self-paced, like an e-learning platform, like a company academy, where they can just uh, listen to the different uh, presentations and uh, try to expect them that incorporating all the knowledge, maybe uh, they will be successful in fulfilling new projects. Um, there are some companies who are a bit more skeptical than that, and uh, they provide extensive coaching sessions to, to the new hires. I specifically see that uh, the way we learn is a bit better if we apply the knowledge right away. Oof. So me meeting uh, with senior leadership, meeting different people who are leading the departments is definitely a good way. 
specifically, not just to get to know people, but maybe have a side chat about uh, what hobbies they share, uh, just to bond together. But then the next question comes, how much time do we spend in those meetings? And when um, we have a lot of new hires or new employees, or we just want to make sure that everyone feels well, and that's why we spend a lot of time in meetings, then the frustration can come, okay, but when do I finish my actual work? So we need to really balance. And there is also another uh, challenge which might come in parallel with all of these two, is when do we realize when somebody didn't get up on speed? How quickly should we remind them or how um, how strict should we be on like maybe um, you should look at other options. Maybe our company is not the best fit for you. And if we wait too much, then that um, um, employee who is not performing really well could have an effect on the entire team department and eventually on the company itself. So it's quite challenging in itself, but this is just about the onboarding scene. And um, we have to take into account engagement, um, how people like, um, how clearly do people see their personal growth opportunities inside the company so that they stick and so that they want to be part of the company on the long run. And finally on hybrid work, um, obviously, I don't need to explain every company is thinking about uh, a way of uh, transitioning to this new world of work, uh, new way of working. How can we keep an amazing culture when we mostly just meet online? And how could we remain creative and how could we remain supportive to our people? These are, I think, the, the biggest challenges today. Indeed, what stays with me is about the, the, the specific challenge of proof of learning. <clears throat> so today, if we want to show that somebody has learned something, it's basically satisfaction survey uh, and maybe like a knowledge quiz that can prove that you have learned. But the problem is that especially when we move from uh, when we want to transform the organization, the DNA of the organization in terms of values and behaviors that are represented in actions. So today there is nothing to prove that. So there, because there is not that sustainable way to, uh, to, to make it last. Today, for instance, people have moved quite a lot. Many organizations have bought like the LinkedIn uh, learning uh, platform access. But the problem is that only let's say 20 to 15% of people finishes any of the e-learnings of uh, that there is in, uh, exactly. in learning. Wow, that's quite low. Huh? And then yeah. I have another number is that when people go to an in-class training, so the traditional way of corporate uh, trains people, then after two months, only 11% of people will remember anything. So we are not talking even about actions. And I guess that, as you said, there needs to be actions. Otherwise, what the hell? And another Thank point you. that you have highlighted is about the, this, this point of, uh, of immersion. So how do you make in short time, especially in a remote world, how do you immerse people? That's, that's super complicated. It's, it's quite a challenge. Uh, by the way, now I was thinking about one of your um people professors who come from your the same country as as you Michali Chikchek Michali who is talking about flow who because you immersion that relate relates uh, relates to him i think we should talk a little bit more about him during when we touch base about the ways of learning please so we are talking about that Companies want to reinvent themselves either because digitalization, because uh, the times are a little bit uncertain and people loses the motivation and you want to recalibrate uh, the way culture is working in order to that everybody is supportive, more innovative. We want to, we want the best of people even in uncertain time, which is quite a challenge by the way. So according to you, if we want to change and create great work cultures from 
the psychology point of view, what does it mean to have a great working culture in employees? If you don't mind, I feel that this is a so subjective question. Uh, it would depend on the psychologist that we ask. And since I am a psychologist, I am I feel entitled to choose my own answer. Good. So I, I would go with um, a great work culture looks like um, a perfect balance between caring about the individual's professional growth opportunities and the growth opportunities for the entire company. So what it means is that we shouldn't sacrifice neither the well-being of the person nor the business success. It's like creating a, a network of opportunities and trying to match the lines between personal motivations and uh, company current opportunities that are out there and create projects with people and members who are really motivated about practicing particular skills which that project needs. And if uh, we care about the people honestly as like a whole person, and it's not like you are just the employee that I am signing the contract with, I recognize that uh, you are a person and um, with that everything comes and, and that's good. Um, we should we should know about really the deep motivations of every single people, and then we can uh, create teams who are complementary in their motivations, and also make sure that um, that everyone is respected and everyone uh, can feel that uh, they can contribute to a positive impact. And even if we try and fail, it's not going to be the end of the world. Uh, it's more important to learn. It's more important to talk about our ideas. We should be constructive always and supportive to each other. So. All of these prayers, unfortunately, I have the impression that how do you go and be trained on how to fail nicely? How do you go and be trained about being a collaborative team or how to contribute to the organization, how to have a positive mindset? These type of things, you cannot learn it with LinkedIn learnings or, or, or with traditional learnings. How should we start learning all these things that makes a healthy work culture? Uh, these days, uh, coaching is becoming more and more popular. So I would highly recommend for any business leader who wants to care about their people, but also the success of the company to try out uh, coaching sessions and if we can be a bit more specific here, we can also suggest our common uh, new session on Superflow, which is just about the personal growth. So how can anyone tap into their personal growth opportunities, aligning their values to areas of uh, experimentation, to their purpose and the actions that they need to take in order to get there. So um, would you like to also highlight uh, some things because um, obviously you were the creator of the personal growth canvas. <laughs> Thank you. So first of all, we are going to put the link now that you have mentioned it, we are going to put the link below this, the description of this episode. Second, what I, what, what I take as, and you, in fact, I'm reusing your words. First, <clears throat> people in order to learn, they need to be, it needs to be relatable. Like this specificity that you get in, uh, in coaching is good. But the problem with coaching is that it's maybe a little bit less scalable. It costs a bomb if you have to distribute it through the, uh, through the organization. Fortunately enough, there is a little bit of technology that is helping on that direction so that it becomes kind of scalable and not that expensive anymore. <clears throat> there needs to be this feeling of uh, of immersion, just like you do it. And this is one of the things that I, I found quite interesting in Superflow is that when you are doing the exercise, in fact, it's not that somebody's giving you the answer right there, 
it becomes relatable because you are giving answers to things that are specific to you. It's not someone who is teaching you like a bunch of laws or principles that you have to follow. It is giving you just the guidance towards purpose of the exercise. And then you have to discover it by yourself in order to go to the next level, which is kind of the principle of how the brain, in fact, impregnates um, impregnates knowledge because what we want at the end is not like a knowledge is stored in the in the um, temporary memory of our brain, but it goes into the deep memory, the hardwired memory, and that you need practice. You need to have like kind of emotions, and the fact that you in Superflow you go and play with the with the different elements. That's something that you have like uh, the wow moment and you have like, hey, uh, here I could have done them a little bit better. So you have this feeling of scalability and still respecting this, these principles that you can see somehow in coaching, but are also the principles of how, how we learn. So I, I find it super, uh, super interesting, uh, uh, Priscilla, that there is an, an, an alternative. And one of the things also that you have mentioned that I forgot to to take back is about this possibility that when you are learning or or in the workplace, you, I mean, there, there needs to be a way to try, fail, and there is no consequences. That it is almost like you are incentivizing someone to dare to do something if you really want to create innovation. But if you are a pretty traditional company, of course, maybe you are, you don't want this risk to to happen but we all want to improve ourselves because what we are touching and and you have mentioned it is that we want to improve as a whole person it's not only about a specific skill that i want to acquire we want to become better at many things that are our personal challenge like my introversion for instance has always been a personal challenge but i have to learn it and it, it, i didn't learn it through a book i didn't learn it is maybe there the repetitive um, practice, maybe the inspiration from others who I found, oh, he's a brother, he's also a teammate who talks to many, to hundreds of people, good, I can do it. <laughs> and it's also about creating a, a, a mindset. So I find it quite, uh, quite interesting, um, the way how the evol that the, there is opportunities in learnings that haven't been tapped yet, and that I find it quite interesting that you are working on, on redefining these opportunities. So yes, and maybe a note for those who are just uh, listening and, and don't know what Superflow is. What we are working on is my passion in um, transforming the world of learning and development from a one-way information stream to more like a place where you can learn by doing with a coach or a mentor who really knows that field. That could be just an expert or your team lead. And instead of listening to the videos for hours long and then completing quizzes, with Superflow, you can enter into an exercise. You can imagine it either like a whiteboard session or a digital workbook, but at every single part, there are questions that if you think about the answer for those questions, it really helps you to discover untapped parts of um, uh, the specific area you want to learn about. And um, solving for those questions or filling in uh, a planning template, it can help you to come to the next level. Now, the challenge with most of these whiteboard-based sessions is that you either have to be there at the same time with the mentor, or you have to be really skilled in how to fill in, for example, the entire design thinking process that uh, just you just mentioned. So what we do with Superflow is um, we transform the experience to the asynchronous, so self-based world uh, with video-based nudges. So wherever you click, you get a video, uh, which is like a facilitation of the mentor, how to think about that question. What are examples that you can think of? 
um, what is your task at that specific segment for just one or two minutes. And then you can go to the next activity. And this way you don't feel you are alone and you have to think about how to use any kind of methodology on your own. And later on, our plan is also to involve feedback sessions. So if you just want to uh, mention the creator or uh, the mentor in the chat, they will see your question and they can actually reply to you, even if they are not there. So <clears throat> I have the impression that you are working in, in a way, and I think it has a name in psychology. I'm not psychologist, Priscilla, I am an engineer. So, and, and by the way, an engine, engineer in biotech, which is completely useless in, in the way, in the uh, learning, uh, uh, industry, but okay. Anyways, um, I have the impression that the platform, rather than teaching you what to do, is more about how to learn. So is is touching towards the meta skills that are necessary to get to your own answers. So it's quite in inspired from the coaching environment. Is facilitation rather than teaching, right? Exactly, exactly. So if we um, think about Bloom's taxonomy of skills, uh, we are, uh, it's similar to the Maslow pyramid of motivations, uh, but Bloom's taxonomy of skills talks about how um, you can get to like higher levels of um, developing new skills. And the basic ones are understanding and remembering that most of the e-learning platforms and most of the lectures are uh, good for. So if you just have to like guess what is the right answer for um, an open-ended question or for uh, just any question, then it's about remembering what has been said a couple of minutes ago, a couple of days or weeks ago. But the higher levels of the skills taxonomy is about how you evaluate different responses? How do you analyze a use case? How do you even create new value? And um, the creation is the highest form of acquiring a new skill. If you are so confident in yourself that you can recreate something new that hasn't been done before. And that's what we want to help people because we think that um, we are in an era with uh, really high performance in our mindset. We, we talk about it every day. That's what we want to do. But uh, if we just keep on repeating the same things, but a bit quicker, I think it's not going to get us to a different result. And I'm very passionate about helping people how to be creative in a way that generates new value and gets them to a destination that they actually want to arrive to. So the, the planning of the tool, there is a, a lot of research that has been done on what to activate from the latest theories in from psychology. Uh, you have mentioned the Bloom ta ta taxonomy. Uh, I mentioned the uh, Mihaly, Chizek, Mihaly with flow. Uh, is there anything that that where you have based anything else that you have based your research from the psychology industry in order to design uh, Superflow. And also tell me the story behind Flow, Superflow, Mihaly, Chichek, Mihaly. <laughs> yes, maybe let's start with that. Um, so um, the sense of flow comes when you feel in perfect balance with uh, the difficulty of a challenge and your skills to solve that challenge. And it could be on any field. It could be inside sports, um, running a marathon, if you are really skilled, or just um, going one round around um, the block of flats if you are just starting. It could be also in um, science, if you are solving like a, a hard science question. It could be in your everyday work, for example, writing a blog post, or it could be even in uh, doing mm, mm, the washing. 
if uh, if you really enjoy a clean house or just cooking. So basically you can apply um, the flow in any field of your work or your life that, um, that you like to um, progress in or which you can relate to. And um, this feeling of flow is more like an alternative of joy. When you are so immersed in what you do that you lose the sense of time and uh, you become one with the activity itself and um, um, you just um, focus so much on what you are doing that, uh, that you become one with the activity Mm. and um and psychologists and also behavioral scientists say that uh, high performance is uh, very directly linked to the number of flow experiences that we have either throughout a day or even throughout a week so that's what um we should aim for in order to increase our performance (laughs) um you made me think about a philosophical question that I guess that I had either when I was in a bar or something like that is that is it our natural human state this state of flow because the state of flow is already appearing in early childhood when we have the kids playing and uh, don't suddenly silence for one hour one hour and a half because they are inventing their world the, the walls um, while they're playing with something. And I have the impression that little by little society makes us like forget our natural state, which is immersion, like enjoying and focus, uh, it disappears. Is that correct? What What do you think? I mean, I mean this is an opinion and uh, I'm, I'm not drinking now, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, we discussed that I like transforming things and I'm focusing so much on it shouldn't be that way that, uh, I see more the opportunities of, um, how people could get into flow in, in every single day. But yes, it's true. Actually, um, even they say our brain works in a way that we like to automate things and we like to have assumptions for everything just to get the fastest straight line route um, from a, even a problem to a solution. Mm-hmm. So if um, just think about it, if we had to find out always from scratch what to do if we run out of milk um, when we are cooking, how to uh, sit into the car, where is a supermarket and how even to park the car without totaling the Range Rover in front of us, then we just couldn't operate. So it's natural that we have to have some automations in um, some habits and some things that we do. And yes, uh, our work and our life is also trying to make advantage of that automation practice. So if we don't um, like look more carefully about what are the activities that we really do enjoy that has at least either a little bit of creativity or some sense that um, um, we, ju- we just enjoy uh, the activity for the sake of doing it without any other purpose um, or it's a, a meaningful challenge that uh, that we like to solve. Um, then, then yes, um, it it could turn out that uh, that we forget how to enjoy um, our everyday activities. But our goal is to turn it around and to to help people to find their motivation, and and that's why we also need to transform learning and development from the repetitive. Remember, even in literature. What is the opinion of the teacher about this poem? Uh, I think it's nonsense and it's ridiculous. Um, I think uh, we should help people to find their own capabilities and and abilities and skills and motivations that align with their whole being. And if we are conscious about what we are good at and what we would like to achieve either in the near future or long-term future, then it gives us so much potential to um, find out a destination where we really want to arrive. And if, if we don't do that, 
um, we might end up always complaining that we are not where we want to be. Wow. So here we have the, the thing is that, and, and, and this is something that is, is quite inspiring, Priscilla, is the fact that the major revolution in, in terms of learning, I have the impression that it's not going to be the technology that you use for learning, but more about the methodology of learning, because I think in the last 10 years, we get access to more research about how the brain works. And, and you mentioned, so balancing these two sides of our brain. So the one that is doing the shortcuts, uh, the one that, that is our gut feelings, the one with routine, the ones that have all the rules that our parents told us, uh, you are good in math, you are bad in math or whatever. So we, which is the majority of our brain. And then we have this small little thing that in fact do, is the cognitive part or the, the, the thinking part. So the balance and the use of both sides is going to make the greatest revolution on how we learn because we are going to use like kind of the emotional side, which includes the sense of flow, uh, which and the rational side who is going to be like, each of them are going to be checking on each other. Is One of them is going to do all the shortcuts, the gut feelings, and the other one is going to verify if, um, if what it's said is objective, what is, is correct. So it's kind of, that, that I, I think we are living really exciting uh, exciting times on, on the, uh, from that side. Um, there was this guy, I think his name is Daniel Kahneman, uh, who was talking about the thinking fast and the slow. By the way, yeah. I fully recommend this book. I loved it. Uh, at the beginning, it was a little bit quite slow, but then it became mm -hmm. like super duper interesting from all, all sides. <laughs> So yeah, and maybe uh, to even think about these two sides of the brain, um, it just reminded me of maybe um, how we can dem demystify creativity. Um, many people think that if we think about how to be creative, then it's about the right side of the brain. And it's all about intuition and, and arts and, and no, be no, no. poetic. And yes, the truth is there is no such a thing as uh, you have to use the right side of your brain in order to be creative. There is absolutely no difference uh, between using the left side and the right side. In fact, uh, what makes a difference in how we use creative thinking and creative learning is the number of connections between uh, different parts of your brain. So the more number of connections you have uh, from the right side to the left side of your brain, and the more associations you can tap into, the more modalities uh, you can remember, feel, uh, think, imagine, the more creative you will be. Totally, totally. So what we are saying is that and this is something that can be practiced indeed, even for, I don't know, nerds like me or with engineering degrees that, uh, that, that think that analytical data is everything. We can also practice this creativity, maybe, I don't know, throwing some, I mean, the more, as you said, we interact with people that are different with, than us, we are creating more connections. If I'm talking with an artist, uh, I will develop more connections. If I'm talking with a child, I will develop more more connection, somebody who is doing something completely different than me. Uh, also, the, the, the way that the more communication interactions that we have, that helps in terms of creating this creativity. And you are totally right. Creativity does not belong to the people who are just using one side of the, of the brain. Creativity belongs to everybody and it can be trained. In fact, that's amazing, right? Absolutely. Now, talking about the speed of, of, the, of the world, the expectations on, of agility in business, uh, sometimes it's not in line with, uh, with the way we are learning in corporation. In fact, you always hear a, a business guy saying, oh, this is too long, to, in order to be uh, too long, too expensive, not practical, uh, something that is quite important when learning, not available when needed. So, I mean, you don't need to be trained in being a better leader 
uh, after six months that you have entered into the position or, have, or sometimes even years of your position, you need it when you are going to move to that, uh, to, to that different level. So imagine that you have like, a, you are a magician, the Harry Potter sister, uh, you have a magic wand. What would you do in order to, that learning is at the same pace as what the business requires? because agility is in the mouth of everybody. Uh, I really like um, rapid project-based learning, learning by doing. And the aspect that we haven't talked about yet is experimentation. And how could any company allow for that? Um, so it depends on the importance of the project and the importance of the task and obviously the company culture. How, for example, uh, Slack is approaching the experimentation paradigm is through empowering every single employee, mostly engineers. Of course, they have mostly engineers inside the company that if they have a new idea, then they can go into one week of prototyping together with the team. So first, prototyping doesn't just look like, okay, I'm making designs and then uh, hard coding and then I'm done. In fact, it has more like how to validate it with real users or real potential clients. That is the first thing, that they talk about uh, the opportunity and they translate everything into questions which they can um, use in discovery interviews with potential clients or users. With their answers, they come back and together with the team, they transform the knowledge into a visual representation of the solution. So that could be like a, even just a paper prototype or uh, a Figma clickable design prototype. Then they uh, also develop some sort of backend to it just um, to process the first uh, source of information. And then uh, they bring it back to the users and, and clients and they see their reactions both uh, verbally, non-verbally. So what they do uh, with, with their solution. And from that, they can conclude if it's worth it to really put extra resources for a longer time to start developing even that uh, new feature, or is there some learning which transformed how they look to the problem itself in the beginning? And I find it fascinating and, and easy to apply to even other industries. First, um, sometimes we take meetings, like hours of meetings, just to argue about assumptions. And nobody is doing knowing what is the answer, but we are still arguing, like, I think this would be good. No, I think that would be much better. And uh, it's so much easier to say, okay, uh, let's do a short test um, and let's try to validate our assumptions. Or if um, we are talking about a traditional company, then I really like the notion when um, they put talents into a group and say that, okay, at least certain percent of your time, you are allowed to work on a um, blue chip project. Whatever you think would actually make a difference um, in your department, in our industry, the scope is up to you. Uh, you can do it on your own, or you can even find people who you would like to work together. And then, um, for example, a six months long of training about how high performing teams work, what are the methodologies they use, um, how to set objectives, key results, how to plan together, how to narrow down the feedback, how to prioritize, maybe use design thinking, lean agile techniques on an advanced level. Um, they can perform and, and put their project results into action. And um, meeting many times with the leaders, showing what a blue chip project would look like, it really inspires them. And even if they just put like um, five or six hours a week for six months long, 
um, it really can transform their lives and and the lives of the companies. So I think these are the learnings that uh, that really stick and and we should encourage. So if I understand correctly, you would use your magic powers to deploy this type of of visions. Um, I like it. I like the fact that that in order to bring innovation in uh, in a team and to accelerate learning, we need to learn by doing. And as you said, experimentation, working on a specific project in a specific challenge creates that. Having teams that are from various, I don't know, uh, departments working together. Um, also the fact that if for, which is something that some companies have started doing maybe 10 years ago, Google did it to have like this one day where you work in the project that you want. But of course, they still need to do a validation. You don't work on useless things. You need, and for that, there is processes. You have mentioned design thinking, agile, lean, which are stuff that most of tech companies that are recognized will, will, will use. But I want to play the devil's advocate. Yeah, so let's imagine that I, I'm coming from a corporation, that the real one who is huge. So am I going to allow people to take some time off from their work because it costs, uh, they're paid to do the job. He's an accountant, leave him to do accounting. Why he needs to, to, to work on something else? Am I, it, it is going to create um, a little bit of chaos. So doing these things is not always appropriate in a, in a work environment where we need to have processes in place. What would you say to that? Mm, I'm, I'm actually um, a rebel on, on that field. And um, I feel like every company who is uh, like believing in this short-term thinking is going to be disrupted very soon. These are so challenging times, obviously, that we live in. And uh, if we just uh, try to step back and wait and repeat the same processes that, uh, that we were repeating all over in the past years, uh, guess what? I, I don't think those companies will survive. So unless uh, we can optimize for what, what could happen with our industry, what we might uh, do with product services, processes, how to do things differently, um, that, that I, I see that this is the only way out of the crisis. We cannot repeat the same thing all over again. And also, guess what? If we expect people to just click and from tomorrow we will do an updated process, well, it's not going to go with that. We have to have the practice. We have to like start with different things, notice what works, what sticks, um, get a lot of feedback, learn from the feedback, try new things, improve. That's, that's the only way. So you can say that you want to repeat the same thing. You can go as long as maybe a quarter until you report uh, what has been done. But um, if all of your quarters are like that, then after some years, I think it will indicate some problems. I, I love it because what you, what you mentioned is that th this concept of being disrupted can come from two sides. One is because you are not catching up with innovation, but a small company or a small person somewhere hiding in his office at home is trying to find a way how to shortcut you. And the other one is about talent attraction. So you are being disrupted because you will not attract this new generation of people who wants to experiment, who wants to continuously learn, to have to, they want to work remotely, they want to work from Thailand, they want to work from anywhere, and they don't have the possibility to learn by themselves. And Generation Z is totally on board on having a different way of, of coming to, uh, to, to decide, in fact, in which workplace to work. If I'm thinking about my generation, it was all about who gives me money, who gives me status. The new generation is about work. Uh, how do I find a, a life that is uh, that is balanced? How do I, I, I 
I enjoy learning from uh, from others. Uh, so the the financial perks, in fact, has become the number four or five in in the list of these people. So you you will not be able to attract them if you are in a very traditional setup of of working or of innovating. So these practices of separating some time from anyone in uh, in the workplace to do something that they would like to participate in, like an experiment, right? That 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 is something that is quite good, giving them the possibility to to use the uh, a, met a process in order to design, improve things that are out of value, where we are balancing this right side of, I don't, I don't want to call it right side, left side, but these two sides of the brain, uh, it, that is that is quite amazing. Uh, what would you say to someone who is scared of changing the current way we are training in corporations? So current way defined by today, the world is e-learning and in-class training. How can you convince them to change? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I would like to like really convince those people who think that e-learning um, is the only way for them. But, uh, but if somebody has already been uh, starting to think about maybe we should do better than 20 percent completion rate and nobody remembering almost the content of um, the learning materials then I would say if they want to go for the safe routes, then start uh, with simple things. Like, for example, they can um, review uh, the results of um, how people complete a digital workbook together in one session. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can create um, even maybe uh, a brainstorming session or uh, just a even if they are so traditional, they can send out a survey about what topics interest people and maybe organize a lunch and learn session when people can really discuss those topics and, and give feedback to each other. Or um, if everyone has like at least one motivation about in which direction they want to develop in, we can uh, or learning and development professionals can also organize random coffee chats with two people who don't know each other, but share or complement each other's motivation so that they can talk about it. And in fact, in Superflow, we also have uh, another uh, flow training session on how to discover your career drivers. And in that, uh, everyone can just do it on their own and maybe share like, what is the outcome? What are the most important drivers and motivations? And it gives you cards. So it's really not hard. It, it has like um, 25 cards between which they can uh, choose and prioritize on how important each of the drivers are and how much they feel they are already present in their um, everyday work that they do or how much they would like it to be present because it's a bit missing. So it's such an important information for, for everyone to make sure that uh, your employees are happy and uh, feel like they, they have the ability to grow. And that you also care about them because just asking the question and thinking about how to fulfill their needs, it's also a message that I care about you. And it's not just uh, the company KPIs that, that matter, but, but also we are people first as a company. It shouldn't be just a word. We should act on that. That's right. And... The thing that you have mentioned, uh, I like this approach of if if people do not know, because I mean that could be the root cause of any of the fears of of, of people who are uh, who are deciding to keep the traditional methods, uh, is either because I don't know better, so go and try as you have suggested. So we will also put the career drive uh, flow on under the link. So try something and then it's because maybe 
So one is that you don't know that what is available as solutions. And the second one, it might be because you don't know enough about the realities of or, or the realities of what is happening on the brain of people, the psychology of people in the current setup at, at work. So you don't know if they are scared, if how they are in terms of motivation, which is then go and measure. So it's action-based, or it is about, I don't know if there is any other method to, uh, to learn. And, and this is something that sometimes we have long discussion with people from, uh, from HR is about how much they have been keeping themselves up to date with what is happening on the knowledge of psychology today. Because even if you were a psychologist who uh, studied 20 years ago, things have changed drastically. Yeah, and maybe work, business has formatted you already into the mindset of just focusing on processes and uh, of, of business. But you have to go back to this side of the human side and, and and keep yourself updated because right now I, I have the feeling that human resources or heads of learning and development, they don't know enough about human psychology and how the brain processes uh, new learnings. And this is where the fear comes is that either I don't know that there could be solutions like superflow, or I don't know enough about human psychology to know that there is better ways of acquiring knowledge and putting it that it really reflects on your bottom line of your of, of, of your company because what you are paying for is not for knowledge acquisition but for behaviors that are transformed that you're having impact on on people and that reflects on actions right yeah exactly yeah and uh, what it also means um is if um, we look into how people have a sense of feeling achieving some sort of success, it's always by practice. And now that you mentioned um, psychologists and their view on how this happens, um, maybe we can mention Bandura with self-efficacy as well. Uh, this is also a psychological term that is used widely among psychologists showing that how we learn is always by um, our, our experience looking back on historical episodes of how we were coping with challenges in the past. And that's why it's so important and it's um, so much related to the flow um, theory that um, we should solve challenges that um, are the right size for us, for our skills and capabilities, and that we learn better by doing. Because if we look back and we become confident that, oh, in the past, I was able to at least come up with something and um, I was some at least partially successful with this challenge, then I'm much more uh, brave to get on the next challenge as well. Or it's also in relation to game theory. So the more challenges I do, uh, the bigger challenges I'm willing to take on. And by solving bigger and bigger challenges, this is how I grow. And, um, and it's always about practice. And um, if we just try to memorize different information, but we don't find the right challenges in order to apply the knowledge, then um, it's just... Um, gets forgotten and and nobody will be able to use it like much later on so that's why the lesson i think here is to look for learning so to say in the flow of work um what are the projects that you would like to take on and what kind of skills uh, it needs what are going to be the biggest challenges and what would you like to learn before going into the challenge that you can apply right away it's incredible that like, the size of the challenge of learning is huge so we have been talking mainly about corporations and changing cultures but if we go to the full educational system, because the full educational system is built on memorizing. I have my daughter who is memorizing po poems of 25 lines. I, I have 
My older daughter me uh, memorizes demonstrations in mathematics instead of understanding what it means. Uh, so we have a, a like, and I, I and I think that if we are capable humanly to change the paradigm, I think people will be able to feel better with themselves, happier on what they uh, what they do if they know how to use processes, mental processes to cope and to forget about this load of, of bunch of knowledge that they are throwing at us that is useless a and teaches more teaching about how to cope, how to uh, how to develop skills that are, uh, that are, is about managing myself. And I, I related a little bit more about the crisis with um, with stress and burnout. If we had been able to learn how to cope with this big pressure, we the, the world would be a, a better place. And it's not getting better. Uh, okay, don't start me on on well being, uh, mental well being, because that will be like for another uh, big discussion. Please. Tell me one thing. So how can people reach you to either get more information about what you do or to have a chit chat about being a punk in learning and development? Um, I'm always active on LinkedIn. So that would be uh, the easiest way. Or you can also shoot me an email at uh, pris at superflow.team. Excellent. I will put all this information on the uh, on the bottom of the episode. It was amazing, exciting to talk with someone who really I have learned so much. Thank you, Pris, for today. And Thanks, have an Ryan. excellent day. Yeah, looking forward to 